Hello, friends, and welcome back to another episode of The Robin Graham Show. This is my first recording after the holiday break, the new year in 2023. So I have to say Happy New Year to everyone. And by the time you listen to this episode, it'll probably be near the end of January. So you should be well underway in terms of gathering yourself when getting started on your goals and your missions for the year. So Happy New Year to all. And this episode today is going to be something that I think is going to really inspire you. The conversation is going to be around happiness and productivity. Sometimes as we start the new year, we feel heavy. We feel almost a sense of dread sometimes because our goals seem huge and our to-do list is long and we've just come off of the chaos of the holidays, but never fear because my guest today is Rita Ernst and she is going to guide us on how we can continue to fill our cup and how we can be happy and help other people become happy just by our own behaviors and actions. Now, this may seem a little bit cliche, be happy, be happy, be happy. However, I want to point out something that Rita said to me before we started recording, and that is that you have a choice to start behaving in a way that will help you lead the life that you desire. And when you do that and you make those choices, your life can shift. So please listen to the end of the episode because I know there are going to be so many valuable gold nuggets that you can take away and and really apply to your day-to-day in life and business. So without further ado, Rita Ernst, welcome to The Robin Graham Show. Thank you for having me, Robin. And I was so excited that I'm your first guest of the new year. That feels like quite the honor. Yes. I'm so (laughs) glad to be with you. Yes. Yes. We have actually released a couple episodes already this year, but you are the first interview. So I took some time off over the holidays and I did too. Wasn't that glorious? It was glorious. It was absolutely glorious. And so I'm really excited to dive in today because I think I feel refreshed. I feel excited about the new year, but I do know that a lot of people out there have struggles. And I think a lot of people out there are sitting in this place of, what should we say, maybe apprehension, or they've felt miserable for a while and they just can't get out of that funk, or maybe they're surrounded by miserable people and they don't know how to part ways or to give themselves a little um, balance away from them from time to time. So I'm really excited to have this conversation. Of course, I'm excited to have every conversation that we have on the show, but anyway, what we would, what I'd like to do first is if you would please just tell the listeners a little bit about you and what led you to your journey to get to where you are today and to write your book, which is the show up positive book. So I'm Rita Ernst. I own Ignite Your Extraordinary, which is a a business consulting practice focused on organizational psychology and the development of people and organizations um, from the perspective of what do we as human beings need? What is in our makeup, in in our psychological well-being so that we can come together with other people to create results. And that's all organizational psychologists really focus on, but it's this melding. It's social psychology, behavioral psychology, learning theory, motivation theory, personality theory, right? All of those things come together into this complexion of when you start to bring people together and you say, we're going to take that hill together, How do we do that in a way that we craft an organization where people want to work, where they are able to achieve their fullest potential, bring their full capacity and uh, really feel connected with the people around them. So that's been my whole life's work. And I've spent part, my early years I spent inside of corporations and then I um, departed about 20 some years ago to start my own business which is its own kind of story. But I really understand that angst that you're talking about because I'm a solopreneur and I'm not trying to build a firm and a practice. I'm not trying to, you know, have direct reports and build this. I'm just looking to build a business that allows me to do the work that I love to serve clients that I come to care very deeply about and earn a living and doing what I love. So I know that anxiety you're talking about that some entrepreneurs feel because there's always this tug of war 
about, um, was last year good enough? Can I make it better next year? What do I need that to be? What are my long-term goals? Am I contributing to those in the way that I want? Can I get there? Cause it's in some ways, it's always a little bit easier that for, for some of us, that idea of just going back and being the practitioner uh-huh. doing what we, you know, when you, when you start your business around something you love, which is what I have done, you also take on all of these other elements that may not be things that you love to do, or even that you have the talent and capacity to do. So, so I think it is very real what you're saying for entrepreneurs, the struggle that we often feel that can come at any time, but definitely, um, you know, I can't tell you how many people that I've connected with after like you taking the time off for the holiday. And the first question they asked me is, so what are your goals for this year? You know, and there's, there's this, just the subtle pressure that you can feel around those things. Right. Absolutely. So you said so many things there that, and I think that as solopreneurs or entrepreneurs who are even with a team, we do sometimes feel very heavy and isolated because we have our head down. We're working by ourselves. Yes, we're on zoom, but sometimes it's, you know, we can even have that, what do they say? Zoom fatigue. And sometimes I think we lose sight of the things that we value most and our cup does get a little bit empty. So I'm, I'm thrilled to have you guide us on how we can keep our cup full or fill it back up as we start 2023. So the first thing I want to talk about, if we can, is you made the comment before we started recording that you can personally create your path to happiness. So how do we do that? Well, it turns out that when it comes to work, there's sort of three essential things that all of us need in order for us to achieve our fullest potential in terms of our contribution in the workplace. We need autonomy, which is freedom to sort of make our own decisions and create our own path. And as an entrepreneur, most of us have that in spades. We have plenty of autonomy. Um, Sometimes we wish we had somebody to just tell us the shortcut or we'll go hire a good business coach, a business strategist like you, Robin, right? To help us with that. The second thing is we need um, to feel like we are contributing um, from our place of expertise, right? So we, we need to showcase our competence, when we get outside of ourselves and we start taking on work that really isn't in our zone of genius, our competence can get a little shaken and that, that can, can, can prove challenging. So when we're really dialed in and we're operating in our zone of genius, that's that second piece that we need in order to really fully optimize ourselves. And then the third piece that we need is we need affiliation or connection, right? So we, we need to have community around us. None of us can really operate in isolation. And as solopreneurs, there are lots of places and ways that you can find community. And the beautiful thing that came out of the pandemic is that we learned to create community virtually. You know, it was sort of that jumpstart that we all needed right? To get over our fear of Skyping or doing this kind of virtual connection. And everybody just jumped in with both feet because what other choice did you have? You were Mm -hmm. locked away in your home. And if you wanted to see loved ones, if you wanted to do work. So we all just very, it was, it was, you know, there's that whole burning platform of change (laughs) we experienced. If you ever wonder what that saying meant, um, that's what it means. The burning platform is you don't have a choice. Like, like yeah. it's going to disintegrate out from under you. You have got to replace it. And so that's exactly what we all learned to do. And so we now have, we have ways of creating co- the community that we need and that relatedness professionally and personally in a lot more ways. But the starting point for really feeling happy and satisfied and fulfilled um, in your work self is making sure that you're paying attention to those three things that, um, that you have the autonomy and sometimes our autonomy can be limited by financial things, right? I mean, sometimes we feel like we sort of are handcuffed a little bit 
um, by that. We don't feel like we can make all the decisions in the way that we, we would want to make them. Um, so autonomy isn't always just having somebody that micromanages you. Sometimes your environment can can add to that. So you, you've got to you've got to feel like you have that freedom that you need to run your business. You've got to have that ability to stay in your zone of genius and know what that is, where you feel fully competent. And then you've got to build enough community around you that you don't feel isolation and loneliness because uh-huh. that, yeah. that will really take you down. And when those three things are present, we really do function at our best. And we feel that we feel happy. We feel like our cup is full. And when we have that level of happiness, we also then tend to produce our best work. Mm -hmm. So there's this connection, but we also in producing our best work, it's self-reinforcing, right? We create this reinforcement loop. So, Mm -hmm. um, so happiness is the pathway into productivity, but then there's a self-reinforcing loop where if we are doing really well, if we're producing what we want to to do, whether that's in service or goods, and, and we're feeling strongly positive about that. It's reinforcing, it's motivating. And so that's why startups, despite how big of a grind it can be to, to, and there's so much uncertainty in startups. It's the reason that startups have this effervescence to them that you don't often see in more staid organizations, because there's this sort of self-reinforcing loop of Yes, I'm working very hard, but I have this really clear intention and goal and it's manifesting and that's self-reinforcing. And, and so I continue to want to drive myself at such a a hard pace. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, all of these three things actually bring me to another piece of the conversation we had before we started recording. And that was that we have a choice to start behaving in the way that we want, or start behaving in a way that will make us happy and to stop waiting for other people to change. Yes. And I think if we, you know, if we look at, even you mentioned the opportunity to, to make, to build community online over COVID, that was a, a choice to, you know, that was a behavior we could choose to implement, right? So that we could then have a different outcome. We could have sat alone and been isolated or frustrated or overwhelmed or just given up on our businesses. But when we make that decision to build community, then we have more opportunities. We have opportunities to be happy. We have opportunities to collaborate and be productive. Um, So let's talk a little bit about that and how we, how you suggest that we change our behaviors and not wait for someone else to change their behavior. So is context behind that. Let me just give the little piece that I didn't give in the intro that you requested, which is about the book and the work around show up positive. So I wrote this book. Um, one of the reasons I took such a long, lux- luxurious time off this holiday was in my holiday season of 21, I was writing my book. So I, I had the idea for the book. I pitched it, um, found my publisher and I had two months to get it all done on paper. If I wanted to get a a release date in, in the middle of the year. So I was, I was really on a tight deadline and that's all I did was just try to take all the thoughts and, and put it onto paper and, and the, the book and the title show up positive came out of work that I, consulting work I started doing, OD work I started doing around culture repair that was triggered by the pandemic. So I don't care how fabulous the culture at your organization was going into 2020, you hit a, a significant speed bump that derailed you at some point. And the, and whether that was early on or it took longer for, for um, businesses that were essential workers, that's, that speed bump happened somewhere between um, late April and July. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it, it just depended on how strong your culture was prior to that. If right. you were one of those businesses that closed and everybody went home and worked remotely, that speed bump has come as we 
in in this last year as we tried to re-enter the workforce and navigate this whole thing of hybrid working and what's what what are the requirements. So it's coming at different cycles for different people, but cultures took a significant hit because we lost our connectivity, right? We that social aspect that we need. Um, that affiliation, we lost that because our social norms changed. Mm-hmm. Our competence took a hit because we had, if, if, if for my clients that were essential workers, they had all these new practices that were changing almost daily. You know, you got to clean this way. You got to do this before you can walk in the building. You got to do this protocol when you go home to make sure that you're not taking stuff back to your families. I mean, there's just a lot of things that made you just feel very uncertain, right? Mm-hmm. So that, so we, we, we lost our connection. We lost our um, competence. And then we also lost autonomy because we had the government mandating a lot of things to us mm-hmm. as a result of trying to take care of public health. Right. But that was something we weren't accustomed to. We weren't accustomed to somebody telling us when we could go, where we could go, how we could go. So all of those things together just sort of blew our minds. Right. <laughs> our our little human selves were like, holy cow, head exploding. What is going on? And so we brought that into the workplace and it, it started out in just commiserating with our coworkers about the challenges of things, but commiserating quickly becomes complaining. And when we start complaining, we find all kinds of things to complain about. Mm -hmm. And we fall into this habit of noticing everything that is annoying and difficult and complaining and complaining until pretty soon we're complaining about one another. And I call that cannibalization where we really just, you know, we, we, we really start to erode relationship in the workplace Mm -hmm. and that's how that happiness meter falls. And when that happiness and belonging meter falls, productivity follows. Right. Mm -hmm. And I want to, I want to just interrupt you for one second, because you're talking about the workplace, but I want to make sure that listeners are, are realizing that this is also something that happens within our relationships at home. It's something that happens with our relationships as entrepreneurs, even if we aren't interacting with people personally or face-to-face, but we're scrolling on Instagram. You can look at something someone has done, and I think so many people spent so much time scrolling over the past couple of years that the comparison, the doubt, the imposter syndrome all escalated to, you know, such a high degree that so many people, so I I just want to point that out, that you could sit around a water cooler in an office and complain, but you can also sit and complain within your own mind when you see someone doing something online. So as entrepreneurs, this is so incredibly applicable, just like it is for anyone who's in the workplace. So sorry, I didn't want to, I I apologize I interrupted you, you, but I wanted to point that out. Yeah, thank you for saying that. And and oh, by the way, that, that negative habit that can take place in your thinking, in your mindset, yeah. not not just in your interactions with people in the workplace. So to your point about scrolling, biologically, we are programmed. This goes back to our days living in caves and, and just trying to survive day to day, hunters and gatherers, all of those things. We needed to know where the dangers were. Mm-hmm. And we were, you know, high antenna for recognizing danger and extricating ourselves as quickly as possible was what was required to survive. Yep. And that part of our brain still exists. And so we are preconditioned to notice a- alert, self alert on things that feel like they're risky or endangering us. And that includes our feelings of self worth, mm-hmm. right? And when we notice those things, we give more time and attention to those than we do to positive messages. That's biologically, we are driven to do that. That's part of our survival mode. And so the whole book of Show Up Positive, the whole idea behind this is you've got to gamify your brain. You can get yourself out of that preconditioning of only noticing the bad things by starting to insert the good things. Mm -hmm. The more good messages that you're inserting in. So the, the, the analogy that I use, which is from um, the seven habits of highly effective people as well, is that whole bank account idea, right? You've got to build a bank account with good messages 
so that when the negative things come in, the balance might fall, but you're not in the red. Mm -hmm. You're not depleting. When you get into the red, that's when you get into imposter syndrome, Mm -hmm. right? And when, when your feelings of self-worth drop, because you're not putting in, you're not feeding the positive messaging. So the whole book is the whole point of the book is there is a repository of 50 words that are intended to inspire you in ways that you can show up positive for yourself in your life, in your workplace, in your relationships, not because you're trying to fix somebody else, but because you are filling your own cup, you are seeking um, your own strength from within. You're using your agency to create because we all are extraordinarily capable of doing that, of creating what we want. I love Not that. Always instantaneously. Sometimes some things take more work, but we all have the capacity to do that. I, as a behaviorist, I firmly believe that. Oh, I, you're preaching to the choir with me because I mean, there's so much of that exact conversation in my book too, you mean anxiety, because we can, the more work we do to change the negative thoughts to positive, the more we can change the neural pathways in our brain. So our brain is going to go to a positive thought more often than a negative thought, but it's rewiring. And I say this all the time. It's not one and done. This isn't something you pick up a book and you do an exercise one time. This is daily work. And I preach this mindset work because we, we have to create those new habits. We have to change the neural pathways in our brain. And like you said, this goes back. I mean, if anybody's curious, it's like the amygdala and the limbic system of the brain, but it's like way back, way, way back to our ancestors so many thousands of years ago that this was actually, you know, embedded in our brains. And because of epigenetics, like here we are today and it's still working the same way. So it's, it's so important. I want to emphasize that I encourage everybody to pick up the book, but I also encourage you to do the work daily. It's not one and done. Yes. And you know, it's, and that is, I, there's a whole, so the, The book is written in two parts. Part one of the book, I affectionately call the manifesto. It's just the whole, why do we need to have a show up positive movement? Because it's not sunshine and rainbows and lollipops. It is not that let's just pretend everything is okay. And if you pretend long enough, it will become okay. Because that's false thinking. Um, And and I talk about, there's a whole section of the book called, you know, what show show up positive is not. And I tell um, stories that, that really share that, that delusion of we can just pretend you can't just pretend that 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 is not mind over matter mind over matter is what you're saying it is doing the work so mm-hmm. the second part of the book is okay here's work to get you started and you don't you know if you don't have the book you can just follow me on facebook or linkedin i go live every monday i give people a word for the week Uh, today's word is, or this week's word is reflection. So we're just working on reflecting, reflecting on ourselves and reflecting, like being a mirror, all the greatness that we see around us back to others to help lift, lift them up and fill their cups. Um, because when we get in that practice of paying attention to our own cup, we also start to notice that in other people. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's, I, there's an exercise I do when I am facilitating these repair sessions in corporate corporations. It's one of the first exercises that we do is a, is a gratitude exchange. And, um, I require you to sit and write gratitude notes. And then in the debrief, and you can do this on your own. We talk about what did you feel in your body as you were writing that gratitude note? And I really encourage you not just hear this, but actually try this and and pause and pay attention to it. Because what happens is there, you actually somatically, like in the feelings of inside of your body, you'll feel release of stress. Mentally, you'll go back into that moment, whatever that exchange was that you're taking a moment to thank somebody for, you're going to step back into that moment and you're going to probably smile. You're going to feel this lightness 
the, like the, all of these things are going to come up in your body for you. So even before you hand it off, you've already filled your cup. Uh -huh. And then when you hand it off, you're filling up somebody else's cup. Yeah, I love that so much. I'm a huge fan of gratitude. I And I always say, and I know the listeners have already heard me say this, but I'll say it again for anybody who's new here. Um, you know, you, I, I believe in a gratitude practice every single day, daily. And I believe that we can write down at the end of the day, three things that we're grateful for, three things. And it will help us sleep better. And it will help us appreciate even the mistakes or things that we think we failed at during the day, because there's always a hidden blessing somewhere in what we've done. And sometimes at the end of the day, I'm so tired. And I think what on earth am I grateful for today? It just wasn't a great day, you know, but I can think the ink pen in my hand, the journal that I'm writing in, the fact that my brain can communicate with my hand to write my thoughts. Like there's always something to be grateful for. And I, so I love, love, love that you incorporated that into all of this because I think it's so important. Okay. So there's one more thing that you said, um, that is on the back cover of the book and it's related to how misery loves company. And I would love to you to just say that quote and then we'll wrap up because I think it's a powerful quote. The quote is misery loves company until people grow tired of being miserable. I love and, that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I love it too. And it's what I came across. I mean, that phrase encapsulates why I got the call, why the phone call came in to me as an organizational psychologist. Hey, can you come help our team? And it was that people recognized we've slipped into this place where we have these habits of exchanging our misery and it's getting us nowhere. And it's like the toilet bowl. It just sort of sucks you down. Oh, yeah. Yes. And so all of a sudden their best people are like, I, I think I might leave. I don't know if I want to be here anymore. This just isn't the same team. I'm not having fun anymore. Um, that connection and belonging in the workplace is so critical. And if you're an entrepreneur, I mean, I want you to think about people you collaborate with or even clients. I mean, all of us have had clients we had to fire or hopefully you were smart enough to fire them when you yes. get to this place. But we, you know, I have stories of clients where everything was really good. And then the connection just sort of began to erode. Um, a lot of that happens when um, people start, like I, I had a client that just stop returning my calls. And it was like, we were in the middle of some really important, difficult work. And, um, I think they just don't want to face it anymore. Mm -hmm. right? I, had, and so, I had a similar experience and it's, it was heartbreaking to me because I knew the potential, but yes. she just couldn't cross that anxiety barrier barrier to do the work. The fear just kept her so stuck and it, it's heartbreaking to me. And it's funny how, you know, I don't know if your client did the same thing, but my client actually a couple months after, you know, emailed me and said, I am so grateful for the experience with you. I got so stuck in my own head. I couldn't move forward, but I learned so much. And now, you know, her business had soared. So it's just a matter of pushing through, but yes. it's like you said before, you know, we have choices in our behaviors. We have choices in our thoughts. And the more work we do to change that, the more we're going to be able to create that ripple effect for good in, in the world with all of those people around us and all of our relationships and all of our all of our teams, whether it's our solo solopreneur teams with a VA or assistants, or it's in the corporate environment. So you guys, I highly encourage you to pick up the book. Um, Rita, any last comments, suggestions that you want to leave the listeners with? I want to reinforce something that you started to say at the beginning, but I would add a little color commentary. And that is, this is not a sprint. This is not a, it is a transformation, but it is a transformation that happens through consistent practice. And so the whole tiny habits movement, like really thinking about one small change, like you said, writing down three, it's like pick a word, work on it all week and give yourself a goal. You know, on the day one, I'm going to intentionally practice. Uh, let's, well, I, the, um, 
the word I share with you that I love to talk about welcoming, right? Just greeting and exchanging and acknowledging people. So on day one, I'm going to intentionally practice welcoming at the start of the day. I'm just going to make sure that I, anybody comes to my, I'm like, I'm just going to be very focused on day two. I'm going to expand that on day three. I'm going to expand that again, right? You just, it's tiny and recognizing. And I do in the book, I do recommend journaling um, in your practice. And here's why when you end your day and you write down, here's, here's what I practiced today. You know, here was the intention I had. Here's how it worked out. Here's what I practiced today. The next day, if you just glance at that before you walk in the door at work, you are remind you're mo- self-motivating. You're reminding yourself, I know how to do this. I'm actually pretty good at this. I know what this looks like. And even if all I do is replicate what I did yesterday, that's still going to matter. It's going to make a difference for me. It's going to make a difference for others around me. So if even daily, I can't grow my practice. If I can just replicate what I've done before, that's good enough. So Mm -hmm. really just being intentional. And when you track, then you can notice and you can then get inspired about, oh, wait, well, how can I take that to another place or in another situation or expand it in another way? So I do agree with you. I think journaling and writing things down is extremely valuable, but really think about small changes, not big ginormous earth shattering, but those small habits and habit stacking and ways that you can create that change with intention, looking at a long-term view. Mm, Love it. Rita, where can the listeners find you and connect with you? You mentioned Facebook and LinkedIn. What are your handles? So I'm at Ignite Extraordinary on Insta and Facebook. I'm Rita Ernst Positivity Influencer on LinkedIn. But the easiest thing to do is go to my website, igniteextraordinary.com. And all of my links are right there. So you can grab those off my page. There's a show up positive page that'll give you hot links to order the book and, um, and find out more about the, the work that I do if you are part of an organization and you are recognizing these challenges and thinking, I think we need to do some of this work. I would love to consult with you and, and help you in the next 90 days, take this first quarter and just get your culture back on track. Mm, I love that. That's so great. And I will put all of the links in the show notes listeners. So whether you're an entrepreneur or you are someone who is starting a side hustle and you're still in corporate, but you have a team, please spread the word for the episode, share it on your social platforms or with friends and family members who you know that could use this additional support to build their team or to increase positivity in their life so that they can be more productive and do what they need and desire to do. So thank you so much for being here, everyone. If you would be so kind to leave a rating and review, my heart would be so full. That is how we reach more people and we grow the show and I'm able to bring on such incredible guests like Rita. So thanks for being here. Have a wonderful, wonderful day and happy new year.